Thank you for joining us today and welcome back to WAM's webinar Wednesdays. Today I'm joined by a panel of experts from our very own WAM's team. We are here to answer the questions all of you submitted through the survey we sent out. But if we have any time, we will cover any additional questions and those can be submitted through the chat during the presentation. Please submit any questions in the chat box provided below. For any of you unfamiliar, I'll share a little bit about us. We've been around since 1974. We work with small businesses and law firms, and we do specialize in IT for the legal industry. We keep our agreements friendly and always approach contracts with a win-win philosophy. Our team is comprised of experts with certifications in every platform we work with. And as always, WAMS is dedicated to the success of our clients. We measure our success by how well we take care of our clients. So before we jump in and tackle your questions, let's go ahead and take a moment for our superstars to introduce themselves. Kathleen, you wanna go ahead and start? Hi, I'm Kathleen Vitek, and I'm the Director of Training for WAMS. Um, I've been training for uh, over 20 years in uh, law firms and other businesses, and uh, I just provide whatever needs our clients want, anything from training when we have a major upgrade to small software changes, new hire training, and uh, if you have a software that you're interested in, uh, I can consult with you on that. I can learn it to train it. And uh, yeah, so that's what I do. I provide whatever I can to help improve business flow and productivity using the software that you have in your office or that you want to implement. Thank you. All right, Brent. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope everybody's doing well and staying safe. Um, my name is Brent Dastrup. I've been with WAMS since 2015, but I've been um, working in the industry for over 20 years. Um, my current position at WAMS, I'm the director of consulting and I help to manage the, uh, the engineers that work in the field and, and in the cloud as well. Um, my primary uh, expertise, I guess, would be remote access through Citrix um, and just about any remote access situation um, and also virtualization and, and Azure. In cloud. Thank you. Up next, Court. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Court Nickel. I'm the NOC manager here at WAMS. I've been here since uh, 2018, but I've been also working in the industry for over 20 years uh, at companies such as uh, AOL, uh, if uh, that company can be remembered at this point uh, back in the day. I'm uh, responsible for uh, the uh, NOC services here, which include the monitoring that's rolled out to uh, our managed contract clients um, and configuring that and tuning that so that we are getting the right kind of alerts to keep your environments uh, safe and secure. Uh, also responsible for the antivirus uh, that is rolled out for our, our managed antivirus customers as well as backups. So uh, that's uh, typically on a day-to-day -day basis, we'll be monitoring that and uh, I'll be managing our team where we're handling that. Thanks, Court. Last but not least, Kevin. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Gilbert. I've been with WAMS for about half a year now, um, but I have 10 years of experience with uh, private and public clouds. Um, and I, my title is Senior Systems Analyst, and I am responsible for developing and supporting WAMS Cloud Solutions. Thanks, everyone. All right, let's dive into some questions. First question, now that working remotely is going to continue much longer than originally expected, can you please discuss options for determining the productivity of the remote worker? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, yeah, I guess uh, the way I look at it for helping users to be productive is, is making sure the users that work at home or outside of the office have the tools that they need in order, in order to get their job done. Um, from a user perspective, there's nothing more frustrating um, than not being able to connect into the office, not having access to their desktop or not having um, access to their applications. Um, that's kind of the first step. Um, I think the second part of it also is, is having somebody being able to manage what their goals are and what their expectations and, and when their dead, deadlines are. If they are meeting those deadlines and if they are responsive to emails and responsive to calls, then 
I feel that would be a good sign that they're they're actively engaged in the work and uh, participating and interacting with others. Thank you, Brent. We'll move on to the next question. How heavily should technology skills or comfort level factor into the decision to hire an attorney as opposed to staff or even a paralegal these days? So I'm going to go ahead and jump in on that one since I am involved in many of our clients' new hire training. And one of the things that happens is I will be assigned to train someone who's new to a, a company or a firm, and none of us have any idea when they're coming in what their technology skills are. Do they have any idea of the software that's already uh, at this new company that they're uh, they're joining? And so that can that can be a challenge for everybody. So one of the things I might recommend doing would be to suggest that the hiring team might want to ask somebody coming into the firm about their technology comfort level. Um, you know, maybe if it's not a problem, you don't have to say that it's going to make or break their job opportunity, but I think it would help everybody out. So I wouldn't say that you must hire an attorney with technology skills, but it would certainly be important to know whether an attorney coming in feels really confident with technology, and if not, be sure to plan to assign that person a uh, secretary and a support staff that's very strong in technology. Um, as far as staff and paralegal, well, certainly I would say tech, uh, secretaries and paralegals should probably be um, a very high comfort level with the technology and even pops, possibly know the, some of the software, for example, document management systems coming in. You know, training a new secretary with no uh, exposure to some of the, you know, more intense software can be very time consuming. So it would, I think it benefits everybody if you at least at minimum have a discussion during the interviewing process with the person about their technology skills. And uh, you can even have them evaluated in advance. That's something that I've done for clients over the years is actually help evaluate candidates because if the tech part of it is important, you want to know in advance what they have to bring to the table. Great, thank you. Next question. How do we determine that our remote workers' computers aren't causing a breach in the security of our systems? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, on all of our environments, especially remote environments where we have Citrix um, in the cloud, uh, we are monitoring those with uh, agents. We have it locked down um, through security policies uh, that are intended to prevent uh, a variety of intrusions. But in an ideal world, we would have um, that customer equipment, whatever home system that these users are using would um, be monitored as well. Um, wherever possible, we recommend that business systems be rolled out to, to the remote workforce for that reason, so that we can have monitoring agents to ensure they're patched, they're up to date, antivirus hasn't skipped a beat, things like this. Um, but uh, we are actively monitoring um, for uh, security breaches, um, antivirus uh, related issues. So, yeah. Thank you, Court. All right, next question. What exactly is MFA? Why should we consider setting it up? And what does it take to implement cost, setup, and training? Oh, is that what I'm supposed to take? Okay. Yeah, multi-factor. Um, most, most of us are familiar with multi-factor in a way, um, oftentimes banks now. Um, banks have been implementing multi-factor to make sure um, to help to verify that uh, that you are actually who you say you are. Um, the bank will link your your online account with if, with the phone number or an application that goes on your phone. Um, and that can also be applied to office computers or remote access such as Citrix and, or Microsoft Remote Desktop. Um, so when the user, the employee, logs in using their username and password, they also get a prompt on their phone. Um, that prompt on their phone could be through an application and they have to hit a button to approve and accept that login. Um, or it can also be a text message and they have to type in a, a code, whatever that is, six digit code or such. 
Um, this way, it verifies that you not only have the username and password, but there's the second factor, which is something that is specific to that individual that typically is not shared with somebody else. And, and that way it helps to verify that that user that is logging into the system um, is, is who they say they are. Um, it can be implemented in many different ways and many different solutions as far as um, not only a, a cloud desktop, but also even the local computer. Um, it's available for almost anything and something that, uh, that any MSP such as ourselves would be able to, to implement. Yeah, I would say that it used to be traditional thinking that, that we could just have secure passwords, a uh, long password or, or randomized password, and that would be sufficient. But these days we're seeing every other day, uh, major corporations, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, uh, Experian that have had data breaches. And so these passwords get out there. And if there's no second step that they have to get through, they can sit wherever they are and start jumping into you know your environment um in the tools that are used in the it industry they're now enforcing that every one of these tools have mfa we uh, <clears throat> excuse me as uh, providers are not able to not have that enabled it's it's enforced so it's one of the probably the most uh, highly recommended things in the current security world that we could recommend yeah, exactly. We've done a few, oh, sorry, we've done a few of them, even remotely since since COVID. You've done all the implementation, Brent, right, with the team. I've been able yeah. to train, and we've been able to assist. So, you know, all these things can be done even remotely and and successfully, even even you know, quite large firms. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you, guys. Next question. How do you best handle your remote users' issues of compatibility, their home internet speed, getting booted off the system, et cetera? Yeah, I can take that. Um, we typically, it, it depends on, the, on what kind of environment we have set up for you, right? If you're logging into a cloud desktop, a Citrix environment, it's meant to be compatible as much as possible across the board, whether you're on a Mac, PC, uh, an older operating system back a few years. So in most cases, compatibility doesn't come into play as far as being able to get into the environment and do your day-to-day -day work. More often than not, though, it does come into play for either the security side or being able to, to stay connected uh, through wireless. A lot of times we'll see uh, end user systems that they'll lose connection. We're doing a lot of troubleshooting at a help desk or the knock side where we're trying to determine why, what's going wrong with the system. Is, it, is there something wrong with the system that we've missed a monitoring alert or things like that that's just not configured properly? And that's not really the case. It's just a home router doesn't like a particular system and you know this user hasn't been working solidly from home before or um, with changes uh, that have been rolled out, um, either Windows updates or these things that, that change, uh, they're no longer compatible with home-related equipment. So um, often we find that we'll need to look at just that home environment, um, you know, the home or router or the network equipment that's in play, make sure that that is brought fresh. Um, that's often what we're seeing, we're losing connectivity um, internet speed, same kind of thing. We can uh, take those kind of issues as well and assist. It's kind of up to a policy of what uh, the administrator for that client would prefer. Um, we're happy to open tickets for home uh, internet providers and work with them so that the users don't get frustrated and they can continue doing whatever they're doing um, and, and look at it in that terms. But often it's the home internet connectivity or the equipment that's just been sitting there um, that you typically we, we kind of take for granted in our home environments. Great, thank you, Court. Next question. What advice can you give our employees at home that have remote connection issues? Do they need to upgrade their computers? Do you have any advice as to what they should purchase? Um, what changes and improvements in their home system do you suggest? Yeah, I, my first thought on this is Minecraft. You you keep your kids happy with their games, and yeah. your computer will work perfectly. Um, um, that's I mean sometimes I mean a lot of us have we'll have kids at home, and those 
those kids need their games to work and they sometimes they, they know exactly what they need um, to keep happy and oftentimes if you do have a child at home they they may be able to help with the setup um, um, I know especially in this uh, COVID time and, and working from home um, you may not always want to bring an outside person in to help and bring them into that that safe area at home um, so oftentimes relying on families is, is a great source um, you'd be surprised at what your 10 year old knows about your computer he'll probably sit down and look at it and be like mom dad i mean come on this is computers five years old your mouse doesn't work it still has a little roller ball on it um they'll have plenty of advice for you um but of course as also within your company hopefully um if you don't have your own tech person relying on a relying on an outside source such as an msp um a whams were clearly an example of that but uh any msp would be able to help with that and they'd be more than happy to get on the phone and discuss exactly what your system is and and uh and things that could be used to improve it um every business has their own rules um whether or not they expect people to use their home computers versus buying a work computer but if you are the type of business that will supply all the users with uh, with the business level computer we make sure we have and court had mentioned or I mean remote access to it and the ability to support it um Many of our clients, when this home work at work at home order came back in in March, it was a real sudden change to their their own environment. And oftentimes, I was on with many clients trying to sort out the internet access and and making sure their monitors were set up. And I was doing all this remotely. Um, yeah. In some cases, I used a uh, uh, FaceTime, and we we're able to help with that. I'm not sure if anybody else has any experience with it, um, but. I know that's something I was involved in a lot in March when that first happened. Yeah, we, we certainly have the ability if somebody calls in and just would like that answered and that's um, you know a request that's approved by the administrator, we're happy to jump on real quick like and uh, we can determine what the specs are of their equipment um, and make recommendations. Um, in a lot of cases, if you can bring what's known as a solid state drive into play a lot of these sluggish home type computers can be brought much, much faster. Uh, you'll tend to see, again, these uh, connection losses that we had mentioned before disappear. A lot of times that's just due to uh, the equipment that comes standard in a residential computer that doesn't really come into play until you start, uh, you start to do these uh, business applications. So um, we can set up a you know, service call if need be. Um, where we can safely come into the home and and uh, up, upgrade the equipment to a solid state drive if need be. And then also um, the location, um, whether or not you're using wireless versus a cable. If you're on, um, if you're relying on Microsoft Teams for for a lot of audio and video conferencing, um, and you have issues with wireless, sometimes positioning um, your computer and your workstation in such a way where you can run a cable to it. Um, that way you don't have to re rely on a wireless signal which may not be as 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 reliable yeah very very true wireless is uh the big thing that's out there right now but it, it, as far as stability it tends to come uh with with issues uh it's it's a convenience but uh, there are downsides to it that you can certainly eliminate by plugging in yeah it, it it reminds me of a story years ago i, I was in high school helping a neighbor out with their wireless and and things would work great. And then in the middle of the day, she would call and say, it's not working, can you come over and take a look? It took us a few days to figure it out, but we realized her office location compared to where the wireless equipment was, she had a bathroom in, in between. And if the shower door was closed, wireless wouldn't work. You open the shower door and it worked. Um, so with wireless, you have to keep in mind what things may be interfering. And so in that shower door, maybe it was lined with lead and it was just blocking the signal. So you're saying uh, wired in would probably help. And so another question I have for you is, are you guys getting calls from people who are at home with, you mentioned at the beginning, Brent, you know, people with a lot, you know, kids at home streaming and playing games and, you know, what what do you do to, to help them when, you know, the, the worker needs to, <laughs> 
to have the best connection other than get in there and tell them to get their kids off there. <laughs> you know, to, to be honest, I don't think I've I've heard that that kind of complaint from home too much. I know it's something that comes up in offices. Um, when you have 100 people in an office and everybody's streaming, that does have a negative effect mm -hmm. on Internet. But I don't think I've heard that much too much from home. Um, no, that, that's not coming through to the help desk or anything that you guys have heard of. Not not that I've experienced personally. I know um, I've heard, actually heard the opposite, um, where my kid can't play his game or can't stream. And from my point of view, I'm like, well, is this business related? And well, it keeps me happy. So I said, OK, it is business related. We got to keep you happy. And then we can... <laughs> make sure everyone's yeah. functioning. Yeah. Happy workers make productive workers. Yeah, Correct. it's the other way around. I, I I boot my kids off their games if they're affecting my work. No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Next question: How can we help users understand that providing thorough, timely information about a problem will directly benefit them by helping us troubleshoot and resolve the issue in less time? All right. So I'm going to jump in on that one. It just it reminds me of so many times over the years providing support, you know, walking around to people maybe after an upgrade and or going to an office and just doing one-on-one -on -one training and having somebody say to me, I don't have time to deal with this right now or how long is this gonna take? And, you know, what I would say about that is that, you know, you, I think you just need to be spreading throughout your organization that when someone calls to assist you, I understand that you might be busy and uh, you know, you've got something on your plate right now, but it takes time to fix problems. It takes time to evaluate problems. And if you can afford to give the time to allow the tech person or myself, if I was coming to help with a software related issue, and uh, not only can I help you fix that problem or our engineer can, but then we can also help resolve oftentimes for you know um, others in your organization. So I understand that you know that balance there, but it it really doesn't benefit anybody, yourself or anybody else in your organization to not assist by making time to allow a engineer or somebody like myself to jump in and answer questions. and you know, Ashley, you and I were talking about this as we were preparing for that. And uh, I think you had a really good suggestion about how administrators and leaders in the organization can help, you know, help push that sense of cooperation through. And so I thought maybe you might want to share a little of your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in any case, it should always be a part of your IT, your technology policy. And if you don't have one, you should. <laughs> um, you definitely want it to be very black and white on how issues should be handled. And, um, you know, when we got this question, I found it a little bit silly, I have to say, um, thinking that someone would be putting something that they want done immediately over resolving an issue like this because of productivity, right? But the reality is, is you're actually going to hinder productivity even more by waiting to resolve your issues. Um, and kind of a, an analogy I have for that is you wouldn't continue driving on a flat tire, right? Just because you have somewhere to be. So you want to get whatever your issue is resolved so that your system is working properly. And one thing I can add, and I know Court is directly involved in this since at WAMS, it's the, the area he manages with the remote management tool. Um, I know with WAMS is something we offer, it's a service we offer all our clients and having that remote management tool on on the these remote computers, wherever they may be, um, could help the tech have more direct insight into what the issue is. And, and in some cases, if a hard drive is failing, um, we, we might even know that problem before the user realizes that problem is there. Yeah, and the, and the same rule applies to us, right? It, it, often we're dealing with particular issues that, that seem pressing, but if we don't address these monitoring issues or these issues as soon as we are aware of them, uh, they become much worse. Uh, and we see it all the time uh, from our where we're sitting, right? We, we tend to see these kinds of issues because we're in a vacuum. That's all we're seeing all day long. So that's one of the reasons it's so stressed in our industry to have monitoring 
is specifically for dealing with the issues when they first present because often you'll have a window of time where you can address it before it becomes catastrophic, if you will, or more serious. So yeah, definitely would stress it, but we're like everybody else, you know, especially if at home, if my internet kicks out or if things are going on, I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing <laughs> to address it. But it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like trying. going back to that flat tire analogy. Um, somebody yeah. in red light honks their horn and points down. I think something's I, wrong with your tire. I have personally had computers where I have ignored that and have gone through some some level of pain by not addressing it initially. So it's uh, it's something that we we try to practice what we preach. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, next question. Do your other clients all use Teams off of the cloud and everything else on the cloud? Is it standard practice to run Teams off the cloud? So I'm gonna start off by uh, addressing this since I do so much remote training and webinars and just especially in the last few months, everything I've done has been exclusively uh, remote, nothing in person since March. And I'll tell you right now that I do and always have, when I run any kind of meeting, I always start the meeting locally. I use the local audio and the local uh, cam on my laptop. And then if I need to have myself or the person I'm working with uh, jump into their network, whether it be their cloud or whatever you know method they're using to jump into their own work environment, I start the meeting locally. And for me, it just eliminates a layer of potential problem. Can you run things off the cloud? Yes, of course. But you know, if you're the person running a meeting, then my point to you would be set yourself up for success to begin with. Don't start with something that could be a problem. I understand that it might be much more convenient to be working off of your work network, cloud, whatever it may be. But on the other hand, you don't want to start, especially if you're the person running the meeting, you don't want to start with technical issues on your own side. Now, what I'd like to do is maybe ask you know, the engineers to give a little bit more information from a, a tech, but not too techy side of explaining why exactly it makes more sense. I mean, to me, from a common sense standpoint, it makes sense to run things locally because you don't have that extra layer of jumping into another system, but maybe somebody, you know, one of you guys can elaborate a little bit more on, on why it makes sense to work locally and what you can and can't expect if you're gonna run Teams or other meeting software uh, through the cloud. And I would also want to add that Teams um, would also be in conjunction with other type of messaging apps. Um, I mean, so, for conferences, webinar go to the go to webinar, go to meeting. Right. Uh, Zoom is another very popular one. Um, Teams is something that Microsoft has put a lot of resources in, and our company WAMS has really jumped into it in March with this whole when this whole COVID started. So we've now had a few months experience, and I, I think we've we've really had a lot of success with it. Yeah, what do you think about that? Running it locally versus, you know, versus uh, off, you know, a cloud or Citrix connection or remote connection? Um, it also depends a lot on your environment. Um, if um, Teams is a relatively new product um, that Microsoft has put a, a lot of time and effort in building it up, um, if you have older servers or older Citrix servers or terminal servers, um, that they, they may not interact too well with it because you're, if the environment doesn't support it, um, you're going to have to run it off the cloud. Um, so making sure you have a new environment that can support these newer applications is, is really important. Um, yeah. I I've seen that on the uh, on the knock side a little bit in that even with you know there's a variety out there but the two popular ones right now are Teams and Zoom. Zoom is fading a little bit because of some of the bad press it's gotten but even with Zoom there's a a local side piece that needs to be installed in order really to get it to play with the cloud environment. So we're being asked to roll out um, and push out from our monitoring software this local side piece. So we still have to install software across the board. 
it, it, there is to some extent with Teams when it's used in the cloud, it doesn't require that local bit, but there are some limitations as it is catching up. Um, it's just like you know with other applications, if you have a really brand new powerful application, you're not gonna be able to run it on an older computer. So um, while we're keeping our cloud environments fresh uh, so that we can keep up with these uh, technologies, um, there's still a little bit of play in between where when you're passing over your audio and your camera and all of these things and handing it off to a virtual environment from your actual computer that's sitting in front of you, um, there's more of an opportunity for there to be an issue. So um, if you're doing your day-to-day -day chatting back and forth, things like this, we all use our cloud environment. Uh, we have teams running in our own cloud and we're going back and forth and, and if we're doing little quick video chats or audio chats, we do it right from in the cloud, no problem. Um, general rule of thumb that I personally abide by, uh, which is similar to Kathleen, is if we have a, a critical or really important meeting where we're gonna be presenting or, or just even I need to not miss anything, I prefer to take that extra layer out at this stage of where we're at. Um, I'd rather be talking directly to my camera and audio instead of passing it through a second layer of there might be a problem. Way back in the day, we do the same kind of thing when we're trying to troubleshoot issues. You're asking, hey, is there an extra power strip in between this thing to that thing to that thing? You know, it just creates more opportunity for there to be a problem that right now we're, we're just like to remove. So, And practice. If you do have a big meeting coming up, um, yep. practice. Make sure you understand the application. Um, you know what this button does and this button does. And if you want to record the meeting, make sure you practice the recording. Um, don't don't jump into a meeting and expect everything to work perfectly from the very first time you use the application because somebody told you this is what it can do. I um, mean, you still need to understand um, how to interact and properly interact and use the application. Yeah, and there's a financial aspect to it, right? When you're talking about can we use this in the cloud, you can do a lot of things in the cloud for a price tag. Um, you know, there are plenty of server options that are available to increase to get these things, but it doesn't become practical on a month by month basis, you know, to be doubling your costs for your entire infrastructure so that it, it has the, these extra uh, bits of performance. Well, and I think a lot of people do tend to forget that if your local computer doesn't have the capabilities, when you jump into the cloud, it's not going to change what you're you're able to do right i mean if you don't have audio or camera on your local computer it's not going to uh you know it's not gonna it's not gonna work yeah and yeah, especially uh, older. yeah i mean you know and a lot of people don't realize that or i've been on a lot of uh calls where someone has um speakers but no microphone and they don't realize it until we're about to get on to you know a, a training scenario and then there's you know the scramble for what to do. Now, we also, or I always uh, provide a conference call number as well. And I often suggest that if you aren't comfortable with using your computer or you're not sure whether your computer is going to work with the audio, bypass that altogether. Uh, use the computer for the screen share and then use the telephone, whatever phone you have, and a headset so you can be hands free and dial in. So, you know, if you're someone who's running a meeting, you want to really consider that you have no idea what the person on the other end has. And, you know, to, to play off what Brent said, practice. You know, don't assume that you can start a meeting if you've never done this before, because you don't want to have the issues on your end, because you definitely can't help or control for the most part what people have on, you know, on the other end. So, you know, uh, and, and I make myself available to our clients. You can use me as a practice person, someone you know who's outside of your organization. So, and I've done that with quite a few of our uh, clients lately who've been asking me to assist with training on Teams and, and other other meeting software. And all these, and like Zoom, all, all these programs have the ability to, they have a test meeting built into the program. Um, Zoom true. and Teams has it where it, it initiates a call, you it tells you to say something and it plays it back for you. Um, so if you don't have somebody you can interact with to test, um, well, I assume if you're within the company, you will always have somebody that you could probably grab and set aside. But before you do that, you can use the application's own test feature just to make sure your microphone's picking up. 
right? They want to know that as well. All right, guys, next question. How can we protect our networks against ransomware? I'll take that one. I haven't said much yet. Um, so I think the best thing you can do is inform yourself of what ransomware is and how it works uh, before you try to protect against it. Um, if you don't know, ransomware is essentially a virus that a malicious third party hacker type person deploys on any system in your network. It doesn't have to be a server. It can just be someone's computer and it will just go out, crawl your network and just encrypt all the files it can find. And after it encrypts it, it'll prevent you from accessing the files and they'll send you some kind of message, hey, pay me this money, usually Bitcoin or something. Um, and then we'll give you your files back. Um, and it's pretty, it's a big deal. Um, so people need to be aware of what it is. Um, first thing I usually like to recommend is training people so they're aware of what it is. There's some third party training tools that we have that you can use to train employees. Um, and so they'll know what it is and how to protect against it. Um, a pretty common way the virus gets in is through an email that's called a phishing email. And hackers will just send them out to people to try to get their passwords and credentials and access to their systems. That's why it's called phishing. It's like they're phishing for someone's info, right? Um, and so having your employees know that phishing is a thing is a really great first step. Um, and we have tools that can send out fake phishing email campaigns and keep track of when people click on the email. And even, it'll even tell you if they clicked on the link, if they entered their username and password into the link. And so you'll get a list of who did it and who needs training and stuff like that. Um, so that's a really good first step we can help you with. Um, another thing is, you know, once you're infected, what's the best thing to do is, uh, you know, contact an MSP, someone like us to help you. But typically what we do is figure out how they got in, patch that up, and then we just have to roll back the backups of your files. So rather than paying the ransom, you just restore the files from backup and then you're pretty much done. So that's why, you know, making sure your backups are working every single time, that you have good backups that you can restore from your backups, that's gonna be a big one. And again, you can leverage an MSP, someone like us to help with that. Um, another thing is gonna be patches. You know, all your systems should be patched because there are some exploits in older systems where a hacker doesn't even have to trick you, they can just get onto your system. So making sure everything's patched is a big one. And again, you can leverage an MSP like WAMS to help with that. Um, and then the only other thing I can think of is if you're a compliance customer that needs to meet compliance uh, reports and things like that, um, there's some utilities that we can deploy in the environment to not only be more proactive to make sure every security potential breach is patched, but we can also use those tools to generate incident reports of what happened during the breach. You know, if that's like something you have to report on. Um, so these are all things that are good to keep in mind is, you know, awareness is the best thing. Um, backups is the next best thing. And then, um, you know, just making sure everything's up to date. Yeah, I would, uh, I would say I, I've seen often uh, when we're dealing with ransomware uh, attacks, evidence that uh, the bad actors were in their network much uh, prior to when the actual ransomware was kicked off. You tend to see two two different types of attacks usually. One where someone gets in and away they go. Um, the other one where they are in and tend to try to look who's who, who's at what position, where are the weak spots? Can we start a, a fake conversation with these people to try to extort more money? And then when they feel like they've uh, mined what information they can about what this company is, who it's interacting with, all of that kind of stuff, then they'll do the ransomware just to take them out of play. Um, backups are super critical, um, for sure. Um, we found that often paying the ransom or not, it's irrelevant, they just take your money and run. The only way to really know you're clean and safe and secure is to roll back to a point uh, prior to that uh, and 
backups are super critical. Uh, at the, on the NOC team, we have a, a, one of my uh, team that will monitor that every day check every client's backups, make sure that they are running and that we have solid backups on an everyday basis and address it in real time because that tends to be the first line of rolling back. But in relation to how can you protect uh, against ransomware, definitely monitoring. Um, we'll find, a, in fact, I want to say just this last weekend, uh, rolling out monitoring on all systems, not just the servers, but the workstations will find, hey, there's a lot of bad uh, attempts, uh, false passwords on this one random system. Um, what, what's going on here? And we start looking into, you know, the more technical side of things and we can see every one of those attempts is- In court, you, yeah. I think I remember uh, less than a year ago, you were actively involved in this. You, you saw um, an alert that came across the, the RMM and mm -hmm. you just said, hmm, what is this about? And you logged into the server and you were telling me you actively saw a yeah. hacker um, was actively in the process of deploying his tools to begin his attack. Yeah. And There's in, and uh, you were able to, to shut him out really quickly. I mean, the, 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 they were, there was a slight breach, so we still had to do some work to, to make sure we shut it down, but, but yep. you caught him before the really bad stuff happened. Yeah, we, I've done that on at least two occasions, um, and that's where the you know we throw around all these acronyms, you know, SOC and SEAM, Security Operations Center, and all of these things. But there are additional agents outside of traditional monitoring, where we're looking at the health of systems. There are agents that are monitored um, by Security Operations Centers, where they are looking at what's in the system that isn't tripping on an antivirus what isn't typical behavior um, and it will find things that are sitting there that are otherwise legitimate software programs that people can use technicians can use that are being used in nefarious ways uh, to try to go out and explore the network and determine things and so that's kind of what we saw here where something tripped um, logged in, saw that, hey, there's an administrator logged in on a particular system that you wouldn't see. It's, um, uh, you know, and there's a folder of tools. These tools are meant to start pushing a particular application out. And what we'll see is on ant antivirus, um, you know, was tripping on these things. And what they'll do is they'll have a bunch of tools where they'll try one, try one, try one. Those are all getting caught by antivirus. Ah, here's the golden one that slips past a particular antivirus. Um, and then away they go, um, because a lot of these same methods uh, that you know bad actors are using, good actors are using for good purposes. So it, it's good to have that second line of defense for sure. And to go back and emphasize two of the things that Kevin said, which are the most important, um, user education and backups. Um, I know oh, yeah. Kevin did emphasize that, and I felt that those are yeah. absolutely so critical. And the yeah, and it, um, yeah. Yeah, more often than not, it's just the user education. You find that their entry point was somebody clicking on something. Right. All right, next question. What technologies do you see being leveraged for companies to allow their employees to work at home for extended periods of time? Look at this one too. Um, it's going to be a mix of some cloud solutions, uh, mostly Office 365 from Microsoft, which almost everybody on the call probably has already, and then um, some form of Citrix. Um, from Office 365, you can share documents online with other employees. You can do like collaborative editing. Um, there's also um, you know Teams for collaboration. Um, you got the hosted email, so you get email anywhere. Um, I'd say Office 365 is one of the best things you can do for working remotely, whether you have another sophisticated solution or not. It's, there's just so much in that suite that you get that helps with working remotely. Um, no, Ashley, also, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but I was Ashley and Kathleen, have you had a chance to do a webinar? On, a, on using Teams yet? Because that, that might be a good topic for the future about using Teams in, in the way that collaboration for sharing files. I'm well, not sure we if you've have, done it yet. But. We have, we've done a, you know, a kind of a lightweight one, just an intro to Teams. Um, and of course, I provide a lot of training for firms on Teams. And you know, I'm glad you brought up the collaboration, both Kevin and Brent, because it's really something just 
that you can't do, you know, you can't do with Windows and you can't do with document management, right? You can open a document and someone else can open a read-only copy, but, you know, we haven't traditionally seen options and opportunities to truly work on a file at the same time. And, for example, preparing for webinars, Ashley and I do this all the time. She's at her home, I'm at my home, and through Teams, we'll share a file, and she makes edits, and I'll make edits, and we see the changes real time. You see a little, you know, a little pop-up that shows you her name or her initials as she makes changes, and, uh, you know, it, it really, it, it just, it changes everything. I think it's what people have been wanting for years, right? The yeah. true ability to collaborate on uh, file. Kevin, I'm sorry to interrupt. You're about to, I jumped yeah, sorry, in there, but you wanted to finish your statement. Oh, it's all good. I mean, interrupt away. <laughs> um, <laughs> One other thing really quickly, sorry yeah. to interject. I'm just to let everyone know as well, if you do have like a specific issue um, that you're curious about learning um, how, how to do something on Teams, if you go to the WAMS website under our blog, we actually have a user guide section and Kathleen has put together a beautiful set of Teams guides and we cover a new topic every week. It actually should have been sent out at about 10, yeah, when, when this started today, we usually send it out every 10 a.m. Um, every Wednesday. Oh, and nice, good. Yeah, you're actually able to go in and download the PDF on a specific topic on how to do something in Teams, which I think has been really helpful. So instead of a large presentation like we've also done, it's kind of nice just to quickly be able to refer to one guide on how to do something. Definitely. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, if you're not on Office 365 and you're not using Teams, definitely hit us up. Um, something you should definitely be thinking about. Um, but then the other vendor that's gonna be a big player is Citrix. Um, a lot of you are using Citrix already, but there's essentially two different ways you can go with it that I see. Um, one is if you're not using Citrix at all, um, I would consider Citrix Remote PC. And basically what that lets you do is um, you can get to your remote, you can get to your computer at the office from anywhere easier. Um, there's ways you can get in without Citrix, but it usually requires some kind of VPN client you put on your computer that connects you to the office, and then you gotta open like remote desktop or something. And it's kind of cumbersome. There's a lot of places that can get interrupted. But if you use something like Citrix Remote PC, you just log into a website or open an app, and you log in, and then you just launch your computer. And the user experience is much more seamless. That connection, is a lot easier to secure. Um, and so I would definitely consider that um, if you don't have a remote access PC solution already in place. Um, and then the other form of Citrix you would wanna consider is you know virtual desktops where you don't have to worry about having a computer at an office building anymore. You just have it hosted somewhere, either on your server or in the cloud or something like that. And then you can just launch a desktop from anywhere. Um, so I, I perceive a lot of companies having some mix of Office 365 and Citrix of some form. And in addition, and in an extension of giving somebody a virtual desktop, Citrix also has the ability to virtualize an application. Um, say you have a, a, a database you use, um, say PC Law. Um, you don't have that installed on the computer user, the, the computer at home, but a person, an employee can log into Citrix and launch PC Law and they get PC Law presented to them on the desktop, and it appears as if it's running from their computer. Um, it's just an extension of getting a virtual desktop. And I wanna ask you something about the uh, Citrix uh, remote that you were referring to. Is that new? Has Citrix always had the ability to, uh, you know, just use a, a website and get That's into your- It That's came out this year. Yeah. Oh, okay, that is newer. I, I thought so because traditionally, I feel like our clients that had Citrix, they would have an on-prem Citrix server for remote access. Yes, traditionally, so it, it's it's been available. Well, I guess it's de definitely this last year is something they've really expanded it and made it more available. Um, it's traditionally always been involved with the more premium licensing, um, which can get really expensive, which oftentimes 
people don't usually buy that. But with going the Citrix Cloud route, um, it's definitely become so much more available and much more reasonable in the last in the last year. And actually, I think they, Citrix has even introduced a new SKU, um, the Virtual Apps, Apps and Desktop Standard version, which specifically is designed to give you that remote access PC without having to license the desktop. And it's just been in the last couple of months they've introduced that. Yeah, it's de definitely a good option. I know that you know, not every client has a Citrix environment or a remote desktop environment. And so when they find themselves in this situation where they need remote access quickly, um, often on the knock side of things, we will use our internal tools to provide a end customer uh, the ability to get into their system, but not always are these tools meeting the needs of you know end users. They're designed for technicians to kind of bounce into a system and, and work around right. it. Um, sometimes we on the, the technician side need to make changes so that we as a company are, are changing security. And if you are piggybacking on those tools, sometimes it, it will have an effect. So now that these uh, other solutions are coming out that offer a lower cost um, option, I tend to like uh, that well, exactly what you're saying because of the dual monitor support and all of these more pleasant features that uh, sometimes even as technicians, uh, we don't get to see on our tools. All right, thank you. Next question. How can we protect our Office 365 Citrix domain accounts from being used by hackers? Yeah, so we, we talked about this earlier, but MFA, multi-factor authentication, it's probably going to be the best thing you can do because, you know, earlier when I was talking about ransomware, if someone gets phished, you know, they put in their email address and password for Office 365 in some form or something, then the hacker has their credentials. However, they don't have their multi-factor second authentication. So even though the hacker has their password, that hacker can't get into the account because they don't have the phone number to get the code or the app to get the code to be able to log in. And so that's a huge thing that you can do um and definitely something we can help with um and then you can also apply the same thinking to on-premise you know domain accounts for your your work office or citrix accounts you can also add mfa to that as well so the same theory applies yeah sure they have your office computer credentials but they can't get in because they don't have the second form of authentication to get in and, you know, I've heard people kind of complain about the inconvenience of MFA, and I'll be honest, I, I didn't love it myself at first either, right? Because, of course, it's an extra step. It takes extra time. But I would say it's worth that extra maybe five seconds of entering in a code or accepting something on your phone to keep your network safe. And it's, yeah, yeah it, it is slightly inconvenient to have all your files <laughs> encrypted, you know, just, <laughs> just throwing that idea out there. Definitely. Um, the other yeah. thing too is a lot of MFA, you can like save the device for a certain amount of time. Like, so if you log in at your home PC, you might only have to do it like once a week or something. You know, it's not like you have to do it every single time you work. Whereas that hacker, you know, just because you allowed your home computer, they still can't get into your account, right? So it, it is inconvenient, but it's also not like horrible, you know. And Office, Microsoft with Office 365 has the, the more advanced, um, called the P2 licensing, which actually has a lot more advanced features with conditional access. And, and it actually has an AI built behind it where it learns where you access your computer from. Um, so if it knows you're connecting from at home um, and it knows that it recognizes that IP address and recognizes that computer, you will receive less prompts. But at the same time, it can intelligently understand if you're trying to log in from Redondo Beach, California, and then 10 minutes later, you have a login from, from Germany. Um, it will intelligently know going, wait, that's impossible. And it'll, it'll shut it down. Um, and that's the, the, um, the P2 um, Azure Active Directory licensing. Yeah, MFA is really what the industry is pushing right now. Um, I think Microsoft, our Microsoft rep told us that essentially 99.9% .9 of breaches um, are eliminated by simply enabling MFA across the board. Mm -hmm. um, it, more often than not, what you'll see is some random company gets hacked, 
this particular one of your users has a user account with a password there and often these passwords are used elsewhere and so they will go through and try office 365 first it's at the top of the list this email address that password and they're in they'll use that as a foothold then to mass email these phishing attempts that start ransomware from your company so it's one of those things where simply just turning on MFA, not only will you get alerts that, hey, somebody's trying to log in, why is my authenticator asking me for my code, stops it right in its tracks, um, you know, right then and there. And I feel like I should add, MFA is not an excuse for keeping your password for 10 years. No. Um, MSA, is just, MSA is just one piece <laughs> in this whole security picture. Um, it's still important to uh, to change that password every 90 days or whatever your company policy you developed is. Um, and whatever company policy you have, it has to apply to everybody. Um, having the, the main most senior partner in the company not have to change his password because it's inconvenient um, is, uh, he's probably the most important person you have to protect. Um, yeah. The rules need to apply to everybody from the top to bottom. And and in my experience with working with law firms for so long and many different, even outside of law firms and many different companies, the company culture starts from the top. So getting support from the top really trickles down um, to everybody. Yeah, definitely. Agreed. All right. Well, we, we, we only have a few more minutes. Do we have time for this? And then one more question here? Or? Yep, exactly. That's what I was going to say. We've got time for about one more question here, and then we'll have to wrap it up. So as an expert, what computers or devices do you use? What type of system do you have at home to ensure you don't have tech or connectivity issues? Um, this would be interesting to ask everybody what they use, because I'm sure everybody's going to have a much, much different answer. I mean, personally, um, I, 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 I enjoy building my own computers, have done for years. So the computer I have is one that I built last year. Um, and it's, you know, I kind of have all the bells and whistles. They're like flashing lights and LEDs and uh, water cooled and- Christmas you know. all year round, Brent. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. I turn all the lights off and where's, oh, the, and there's a Christmas tree in the corner. Um, I personally have fun with it. Um, I don't have a camera at home, um, something I do need to to pick up. I think when this whole work at home order thing, all the cameras were sold out. Um, yeah. So I, I, I didn't get one. When we were doing a test run the other day to make sure this whole webinar, I had to pull out the laptop to use the camera on the laptop. So a camera at home is something I need along with the microphone. Um, um, the I, I have my computer physically cabled in so I don't have to yeah. worry about a, a wireless signal going out. Um, um, but yeah, I don't know yeah, if in the last minute, does anybody else say, yeah, Corey, you were going to say what? Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely agree with, uh, and, you know, we talk about the cabling thing, right? You know, we, we've got kids yeah. running around with iPads and things like that, but um, cabling it in, we find that even our Netflix to our TV and these, these things run much faster and more smoothly without buffering down. So we, uh, that's one of the things I've, I've chosen to do is just wire out the house where, you know, I have those things that I like to do, but I'm kind of with Brent on, on the equipment. Um, a lot of the times, LEDs, flashing lights. LEDs, it's gotta be the LEDs. <laughs> no, <laughs> often the really fast equipment just comes with these bells and whistles, but yeah, that's a solid state drives and things like that are where yep, it's solid state. Being, able, yep. being able to support. Oh, stuff quickly. Mm -hmm. So my wife hates lights. So I can't have a nice gaming PC, even though I want to. So I compromised and I got a refurbished uh, workhorse, you know, enterprise level computer. Um, Cause if you get refurb, it's usually like half off. Um, so I have that at home as SSD. Um, I was able to get a webcam before all this happened. So I have like a Logitech webcam, which is what I'm using now. Um, I use a Jabra headset for doing calls between colleagues and things like that, um, and Windows 10, and yeah. That's actually, a headset is something I, I started using with this whole thing. I never used a headset before, so that, that was kind of a new introduction. All right, well, I think that is all the time we have. 
Well, thanks, Ashley, for oh, putting this together. You're welcome. Yeah, no, thank We're you. all done. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Yeah, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope this has been helpful. Um, our next presentation will be on August 26th at 10 a.m. We will be joined by special guests from NetDocuments. More information on that will be hitting your inbox soon, so keep an eye out. And thank you all for joining me today as well. Do appreciate it. Have a good yeah, day. Yeah, thank you. Everybody. Bye, all. Bye.